Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to One Man's yes. Faith. Another fine day out there today. Hope everyone's doing good. So, uh, uh, my name is Kevin, and this is my wife, Cherie. <laughs> Maybe I'm not awake yet. I don't know. <laughs> I only had one cup of coffee. Um, <clears throat> so, we will open up in prayer. Hallelujah. Good morning, Father God. We just thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we thank you for uh, such a time as this, and, and Lord, that you are you have truly blessed us, and you have blessed each and every person out there, Father God. We thank you for an opportunity to just spread the word of God and, and just let people know who you are and how much you love them. We thank you for this time. We ask you to bless this time. We give you praise, glory, and honor, and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we've been uh, working on the uh, Sermon on the Mount. That's we did. We did the Beatitudes here um, for a couple weeks, and now uh, we're continuing with the Sermon on the Mount. But if we want to do our opening scripture, Isaiah forty, verses twenty-eight and twenty-nine. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Amen. Amen. So we have a God that never sleeps or slumbers. He's always there, no matter what's going on in our lives, he's always there for us. So the Sermon on the Mount, um, sometimes we read it, as we've talked before, we read the Bible, we just read stories, we don't actually make it personal. But the Sermon on the Mount is uh, really a practical and detailed teaching on how for us to live our lives for God. Uh, there are nine sections to this sermon, and I'm going to let her go through those. Okay, the first section is the Beatitudes, verses 3 through 12, the salt and the light of the world, verses 13 through 16. He came to fulfill the law, verses 17 through 20. What is it to kill? Verses 21 through 26. Committing adultery. Verses 27 and 32 to 32. To swear. Verses 33 through 37. He exhorts to suffer. Verses 38 through 42. Love our enemies. Verses 43 through 47. And to labor after perfection. Verses Verse 48, and this is Matthew chapter 5. And so there's there's definitely some tough teachings in there for how we are to live. And, you know, we, we think he's talking to the disciples and to the crowd, but we need to put our names in there, our family's names in there or whatever, and make it personal, and uh, that he is talking to us. So the last time we really left off with uh, that we are the, the light of the world, and that's um, Matthew 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, <clears throat> nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So then we, we're down to the section that says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel, under a basket, uh, but they put it on a lampstand. Uh, it would be like lighting, turning on a light in your house and a lamp and then putting a towel over it. You know, it's like, what's the purpose? The idea of a lampstand uh, gives the sense that we are to be um, intentional about letting our light shine. Amen. Even as lamps are placed higher so that they can light, um, the light can be more effective. We should look for ways to let our light shine in a greater and broader way. And we need to go around and whether in actions, words, or whatever, let our light shine. Right. Uh, the text says that the candle gives light to all that are in the house. Some professors give light only to a part. And by professors, we're, we're talking not, we're talking like preachers, teachers, and, and, you know, just disciples. Some professors give light only to a part of the house. I have known women very good to all but their husbands and these they nag from night to night so that they give no light to them i have known husbands so often out at meetings that they neglect home and thus their wives miss the light and that's charles spurgeon uh he is a very wise person he has a lot of, of uh, 
insight in the Word yes. of God. Now, our next one is the Venerable Bede, or Beda. Um, this was a uh, gentleman was from 673 to 735, and he was an English monk, a historian, and a scholar. And when he was interpreting this text, said that Christ Jesus brought the light of deity into the poor lantern of our humanity, and then set it upon the candlestick of his church, that the whole house of the world might be lit up thereby. So indeed it is. And again, Charles uh, Spurgeon quoted him. But isn't that what it, we're really supposed to yes. be? We're the light of the world. We're supposed to put our light on, on a lampstand so that the world can see it. And everywhere we go and everybody we come in contact with, we were uh, listening to a, a, a funeral uh, today of a, uh, one of our dear friends who passed away in, in Ohio, and they were doing the funeral, and they were kind enough to video it. Yes. Um, so people out of state uh, could see it. And so we were watching it, and the big testimony of this that they gave for this woman was the fact that no matter where she went, no matter who she talked to, she was constantly witnessing. And uh, she witnessed everybody, and, and she really was like that. Yes, uh, I know when we, when, we, when we lived there, she, we were always over to her house, which were dinners or whatever, and, um, you know, so... But she really gave her life to the Lord, and she witnessed. And she was a, definitely a light you to everybody. You knew where she stood. Yeah, <laughs> she was definitely a light to everyone. Does and, someone, and, when they see you, do yeah. they know that you are a Christian, yes, or are you right. a secret Christian? Yeah, there is no secret <laughs> agents in the kingdom of God. So they that may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, the purpose in letting our light so shine by doing good works is so that others will glorify God, not ourselves. The object of our shining is not that men may see how good we are, nor even see us at all, but they may see, but uh, they may see grace in us and God in us, and cry, "What a father these people must have!" Is not this the first time in the New Testament that God is called our Father? Is it not singular that the first time it comes out should be when men are seeing the good works of His children? Again, Charles Spurgeon. Jesus pointed to a, a breadth in the impact of disciples that must have seemed almost ridiculous at the time. How could these humble Christians, Galileans, salt the earth or light the world? But they did. Yes. And think about that, that these disciples, just 12 of them, and though not all of them survived very long, but how, much, how many people they brought into the kingdom of God. Yes. They, everywhere they went, they, their light shined. We are... Uh, part of God. Well, Jesus is uh, is our Savior. God is our Father, and and they just thousands of people that they witness to. The three pictures together are powerful, speaking of the effect of Jesus' disciples in the world. <clears throat> Thought I was going to sneeze. Hopefully, I don't. <laughs> Salt is the opposite of corruption, and it prevents corruption from getting worse. Light gives the gift of guidance, so that those who have lost their way can find the path home. You ever try walking out in pitch dark with not a flashlight, you're going to fall down. And that's, so that's God is our light. He leads us wherever we need to go, wherever He wants us to go. A city is the product of a social order and government. It is against chaos and disorder. Uh, Bruce, and I don't have his first name, comments on the first reference to God as Father. God, we learn, as Father, delights in noble conduct. As human fathers find joy in sons who acquit themselves bravely. Now, a scripture that I thought summed all of this up was uh, Romans 13, 11, and 11 through 14. Do this knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual pros promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Amen. So we are to live holy and separated for God. And um, so we don't want to make any provision for the flesh. Now uh, we'll get down to... Uh, uh, verse uh, 17 and 18, the law and true righteousness. 
Um, so uh, Jesus retaliate re relation to the law, excuse me, uh, Matthew 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. Amen. And Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Jesus here began a long discussion of the law and wanted to make it clear that he did not oppose what God gave Israel in what we call the Old Testament. He did not come to destroy the word of God, but to free it from the way the Pharisees and scribes had wrongly interpreted it. And that was the big problem in, in their interpretation. They interpreted that law according to tradition. They kept going and, and you know, it's, it's like that game telephone or whatever. You tell the person next to you something and they, by the time it gets back around to you, it's totally changed. <laughs> And, and so their interpretations of the law were based on what they wanted, not for what the law really meant or what it was intended to be. If Jesus did not come to cancel the law, does that mean all the Old Testament laws still apply to us today? In the Old Testament, there were three categories of law, ceremonial, civil, and moral. The ceremony law related specifically to Israel's worship. You can find that in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 1, 2, and 3. As an example, its primary purpose was to point forward to Jesus Christ. These laws, therefore, were no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. While we are no longer bound by ceremonial laws, the principle behind them, to worship and love a holy God, still apply. Jesus often accused by the Pharisees of violating ceremonial law. So we're not going to go on until we get back from our first break, but uh, these are very good examples of what the law was for. So we will be back, uh, stay with us, and we will be back shortly. And welcome back, welcome back. Uh, once again to One Man's Faith. So uh, we just went through what the ceremony, about the ceremonial laws. Uh, and now we're into the civil law, which applied to daily living in Israel. And you can see that in Deuteronomy 24, uh, chapter, or verses 10 and 11. Uh, because modern society and culture are so radically uh, different from that time, all of these guidelines cannot be followed specifically. But the principles behind the commands are timeless and should guide our conduct. Jesus fulfilled these by example. And you have to think about that. That's the... Uh, principles behind the commandments. There are certain things that we cannot do today because they don't do them today because of society, etc. But uh, we can still go according to the principles of, uh, in, that were set forth back then. The moral law, such as the Ten Commandments, is a direct command of God, and it requires strict obedience. In Exodus 20.13, it reveals the nature and will of God, and it still applies today. Jesus obeyed the moral law completely. Now, there's been a lot of teachings, and I'm not going to go into whether yea or nay, but there's been a lot of people say, well, we're no longer bound by the Ten Commandments. Well, um, you're supposed to love, uh, love God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. You're not supposed to commit adultery. You're still supposed to obey your parents, no matter if you're 40 or 30 or 10. So I guess the, the laws still apply. The Ten Commandments still apply to us today. So, you know, you can take that for whatever you want to, but uh, as for me, I'm going to, you know, still still go according. Yes, God is there. Jesus saved us, and we are wholly sanctified. But um, again, we still have to obey His Word. The Jews of Jesus' day could refer to the Scriptures as the Law and the Prophets. And uh, Matthew 7, 12, which just happens to be the um, golden rule, um, in everything, therefore, treat, and this is the new uh, American Standard, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And I'm um, going we'll to let her read the one from the World English Bible. Therefore, whatever you desire for men to do to you, you shall also do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So, and then uh, we're just, we're going to skip that one. To show that uh, he never meant to abolish the law, our Lord Jesus had embodied all its commands in his own life. In his own person, there was a nature which was perfectly conformed to the law of God. And as was his nature, 
Such was his life. And again, Charles Spurgeon. Now the phrase, for assuredly, which is the New King James Version, or the King James in the NASB says, truly, and the Greek translation of that is amen. And if you look up the word amen, amen at the end of uh, a comment or a statement means so be it. Uh, amen at the beginning means for assuredly or truly. So the, these languages aren't, they, our English language uh, leaves a whole lot to be desired <laughs> sometimes. So I say, to you, I say to you is Jesus' own signature. No other teacher is known to have used it. It serves like the prophets, thus says the Lord, to mark a saying as important and authoritative. It says, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus wanted to make it clear that he had authority apart from the law of Moses, but not in contradiction to it. Jesus added nothing to the law except one thing that no man had ever added to the law, perfect obedience. And this is what where Jesus was set apart from everybody, that he was perfectly obedient to the law of God, <laughs> obeyed his Father. Uh, this is certainly one way Jesus came to fulfill the law, which is what the scribes and the Pharisees and most of us have trouble with. We always, our nature is, flesh nature is to rebel against authority. Even though he often challenged man's interpretations of the law, especially Sabbath regulations, Jesus never broke the law of God. A greater than the Old Testament than, than Moses and the prophets is here, but the greater is full of reverence for the institutions and sacred books of his people. He has not come to disannul either the law or the prophets. And that was by F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, which was from 1910 to 1990. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets, and they point to him, and he is their fulfillment. That was D.A. Carson, 1946 to the present. He is still alive. Jesus fulfilled the doctrinal teachings of the law and the prophets in that he brought full revelation. Jesus fulfilled the predictive prophecy of the law and the prophets in that he is the promised one, showing the reality behind the shadows. Jesus fulfilled the moral and legal demands of the law and the prophets in that he fully obeyed them and he interpreted them in their truth. Jesus fulfilled the penalty of the law and the prophets for us by his death on the cross taking the penalty that we deserved. Right, amen. The Apostle Paul wrote on this theme, and we need to really realize just exactly what Jesus did. He died for me. He died for you. He went on the cross willingly so that you and me and everyone else could have eternal life and we could have forgiveness of sins. And this is while we were still sinners. Yes, and, and Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, to everyone who believes. Because the Word says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. In a word, Christ completed the law. First of all, first number one, in itself it was only the shadow, the law was only the shadow, the typical representation of good things to come, and He added to it that which was necessary to make it perfect, His own sacrifice, without which it could neither satisfy God nor sanctify men. Secondly, he completed it in himself by submitting to his types with an exact obedience and verifying them by his death upon the cross. Thirdly, he completes this law and the sayings of the, his prophets in his members by giving them grace to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and their neighbor as themselves, for this is all the law and the prophets. And that was Adam Clark, 1762 to 1832. Now, this is, I find this very interesting. Um, the one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And, and we read that unless you've really investigated it, you kind of don't, it, it sounds really weird, but the jot and the tittle were small marks in Hebrew writing. Jesus here told us that not only the ideas of the Word of God are important, but also the words themselves. Even the letters of the words are important. This shows us how highly God regards His Word. The jot refers to yod, Y-O-D, which is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It looks like half a letter. The tittle is a small mark in a Hebrew letter, somewhat like the crossing of a T or the tail on a Y. The difference between bet, B-E-T, the Hebrew letter, and kaf, K-A-F, the Hebrew letter, is a tittle. The difference between dalet, D-A-L-E-T, the Hebrew letter, and the Hebrew letter resh, R-E-S-H, is a tittle. 
the difference between Vav, probably not pronouncing these correctly, but another Hebrew letter, and Zayin, which is a Hebrew letter, is a tittle. Now, if you go to Psalms 119, that uh, basically uh, each, every eight verses you have a different, is in a different Hebrew letter. It goes, starts at the beginning and goes to the end. And so each, uh, well, like verse 1 through 8 and then verse 9 is a different Hebrew letter and so forth. And it goes all the way to the end. And uh, the letter Zion happens to just be one of my favorite passages in <laughs> Psalm Very Psalm interesting Psalm. Yes. Though all earth and hell should join together to hinder the accomplishment of the great designs of the Most High, yet it shall be all be in vain, even the sense of a single letter shall not be lost. The words of God, which point out His designs, are as unchangeable as His nature itself. Adam Clark. Till all is fulfilled. This is true in a different, in a few different senses. First of all, it is the assurance that Jesus Himself fulfilled the law by His perfect obedience. Secondly, it is the assurance that Jesus Himself fulfills the law in us by His perfect obedience. Romans eight four and Romans eight four says that righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And number three, it is the assurance that God's plan will never be set aside until all things are fulfilled at the end of the age. Now we're going to go to uh, verses 19 and 20, uh, chapter 5, the disciples' relationship to the law. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So then Matthew 5.19, it says, Some of those in the crowd that Jesus was speaking to were experts at telling others what to do. And many times we are today, that's a, that's a whole lot of social media is everybody's an expert in telling other people what they should yes. do or, you know, <laughs> well, you know, you dress terribly or whatever, you know, whatever. It's, we're all experts in that, of course. Um, but they missed the central point of God's laws themselves. Jesus made it clear, however, that obeying God's law is more important than explaining it. And your actions speak louder than your words. It must... It's much easier to study God's laws and tell others to obey them than to put them into practice yourself. How are you doing at obeying God yourself? Romans 2, 17 through 24 in the New Living Testament. Who who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law and you boast about your special relationship with Him. You know what He wants. You know what is right because you have been taught His law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are, in lo are lost in the darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God. For you are certain that God's laws gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scripture says, the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. And so true. And, and this is one thing that I'm really always trying to watch out for. So I don't come on this program teach something and then go out and do the opposite yes um, because that is not honoring God and God will not honor me so uh, we're going to get ready for um, our next break and then we will be right back stay with us And welcome, welcome back, back to session number yes. three for One Man's Faith. We're continuing on with the Sermon on the Mount. So we were working on uh, Matthew 5.20, and um, 
It says the Pharisees were exacting and scrupulous in their attempts to follow these laws. So how could Jesus reasonably call us to a greater righteousness than theirs? Well, the Pharisees' witness was that they were content to obey the laws outwardly without allowing God to change their hearts or attitudes. Jesus was saying, therefore, that the quality of our goodness should be greater than that of the Pharisees. They looked pious, but they were far from the kingdom of God. God judges our hearts as well as our deeds, for it is in the heart where our real allegiance lies. But just as concerned about our attitudes, which people don't see, as your actions, which are seen, be ju- I'm sorry, be just as concerned about your attitudes, which people don't see, as your actions, which are seen by all. Because many times our attitude shows through, you know, we come off a little arrogant or cocky or whatever and, and you know, treat other people, look down on other people. Well, you're just a sinner, you know, well, <laughs> where are we at? So we don't want to think that. We want to have love for them and, and be really mourning for them, as the Beatitude yes. says, that they are not saved. Uh, Jesus was saying that his listeners needed a different kind of goodness altogether, love and obedience, not just a more intense version of the Pharisees' goodness, legal compliance. Our goodness must, number one, come from what God does in us, not what we do by ourselves. Two, be God-centered, not Mm self-centered. Number three, be based on reverence for God, not approval from people. And number four, go beyond keeping the law to living by the principles behind it. And again, we were listening to a a preacher last night. He's a very excellent preacher, Um, really preaches the word. And again, he was saying, you know, talking about abandonment and uh, Oswald Chambers in his uh, My Utmost for His Highest speaks of abandonment. You have to abandon yourselves and what you want and go for what God is calling you to do. You can't, if God's going to give you a vision, you have to be obedient and faithful to that vision and forget about what other people say and don't go out uh, because Psalms 1 is that I will not take counsel with the wicked. And this is what he was saying. He doesn't just go to somebody that's not saved and ask counsel of them because they're not going to give him the counsel of God. They're not going (laughs) to give him. They may have worldly wisdom, but they don't have godly wisdom. And so he's going to just listen to what God has to say and not go out. And and, and we make that mistake a lot in in going out. That really touched my my spirit last night. Yeah, asking people that, don't know God. Well, what should I do? You know, well, they think you're stupid for one thing, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, but we need to just have godly wisdom. And, and our first thing needs to be um, asking God what we're supposed to do, not asking our pastor, well, well, pastor, what do you think my calling is? Well, ask God, not your pastor. Your pastor, God's not going to give your pastor your calling. He's going to tell you what it is, yeah. and he's going to give you the vision, not somebody else. And then wait. Yes, and wait. And that's that's a, that's a hard one. you got to wait. <laughs> So whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, the commandments are to be obeyed as explained and fulfilled by Jesus' life and teaching, and not as the legalistic thinking of the religious authorities of Jesus' day. For example, sacrifice is commanded by the law, but it was fulfilled in Jesus because he was the the final sacrifice. So we do not run the danger of being called least in the kingdom of heaven by not observing animal sacrifice as detailed in the law of Moses. Now, Whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The Christian is done with the law as a means of gaining a righteous standing before God. One passage that explains this is Galatians 2.21, and we'll read that out of the NASB. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Amen. So, however the law stands as the perfect expression of God's ethical character and requirements, the law sends us to Jesus to be justified because it shows us our inability to please God in ourselves. But after we come to Jesus, He sends us back to the law to learn the heart of God for our conduct and sanctification. Now, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Considering the incredible devotion to the law shown by the scribes and Pharisees, how can we ever hope to exceed their righteousness? The Pharisees were so scrupulous 
in their keeping of the law that they would even tithe from the small spices obtained from their herb gardens. And Matthew twenty three twenty three. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Amen. And so we, we have to be careful that we don't neglect. You know, it, it, it's right up there with, so you see somebody hungry and naked and you go, well, here, let me pray for you, brother. Well, no, what they really need is they need food and clothes, you know. And, and so it's, it's, uh, you have to not neglect something. The heart of this devotion to God is shown by modern-day Orthodox Jews. And this is a, this, this is, story is just, I mean, it, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> in early 1992, tenants let three apartments in an Orthodox neighborhood in Israel burn to the ground while they asked a rabbi whether a telephone call to the fire department on the Sabbath violated Jewish law. Observant Jews are forbidden to use the phone on the Sabbath because doing so would break an electrical current, which is considered a form of work. In the half hour it took the rabbi to decide, yes, the fire spread to two neighboring apartments. So it's, it's how far do you go? I mean, this, can we, are you so legalistic to, to the law or to what the law says that you're going to uh, let property or life be destroyed? You know, let's get real. Let's have a life. In other words, the life of Paul shows what the righteousness of the Pharisees was like. Acts 26.5. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. So Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he obeyed the law, and yet then after he uh, found Jesus, or should I say Jesus found him, he, they really were out to kill him. Oh, he was a teacher of the yeah. law. And Philippians 3.5 says, Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as a law, a Pharisee. Yes, yeah. So we can exceed their righteousness because our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees in kind, not degree. Paul describes the two kinds of righteousness in Philippians 3, uh, verses 6 through 9. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So we have no righteousness of our own, but we are righteous uh, through Christ. Though the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was impressive to human observation, it could not prevail before God. Isaiah 64, verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. So then we are not made righteous by, by keeping the law. When we see what keeping the law really means, we are thankful that Jesus offers us a different kind of righteousness. And a scripture to sum up this passage is Romans 3, 9 through 20. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. Right. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. For there is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, 
so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So now we're going to go to um, Matthew 21 and 22. I don't know if I have that. And that is what it is to kill. And this is, we're going to really come into some interesting things in these last uh, few sections, which we won't probably get to all of them today. But so Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Anger, anger. Okay, that, I was just... Oh, okay. that's okay, his yeah. little note. <laughs> <laughs> that's my note. Now, she does really good at reading my notes. Okay, so um, I'll get into that story in, in, a, in the next section because uh, it's a little long for what we have right now. Let's so keep in mind what Jesus had said. Um, let your light shine. Now, you should do it now. It can convey a sense of urgency. God's commandments always include His enablements. You cannot let your light shine in the natural strength of your fallen flesh. You need supernatural power provided only as you are filled with, filled with and learn to rely on the Spirit. Before men, in, before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify... Um, your Father who is in heaven. So uh, we're going to get ready and, and take our final break here, and then we will be right back. Stay with us. Uh, and this, we get far enough, it's going to get kind of interesting. I think so. Welcome back to One Man's Faith, our yes. final session for the day. Time really flies, I guess, when you're in the Word of God. So the story that I was referring to, um, not necessarily a true story, but a, a very a very excellent story. It gets the point across, and and personally, I can relate to that. I, I, I have had in my time a very bad temper, and I was raised in a home with bad tempers, and uh, so it is his home. So the story of this, uh, there was a son and his dad, he had, a, he had a very bad temper. He would, the son had a bad temper and he would get angry a lot. And so his dad had, gave him a nail, gave him a board and some nails. And he said, every time you get angry, pound a nail into this board. So every time the boy got angry, he would pound a nail into the board and, uh, he there for a while. He was pounding a lot of nails into the board, and <laughs> and pretty soon he began to see what was going on, and so he got less and less angry. And then one day he stopped being angry, and he told his dad, "He said, I'm not getting angry anymore. I'm, I'm you know." And so the dad said, "Okay, so now what I want you to do is I want you to go and pull out each one of those nails." So the boy began and started pulling out all the nails, and what he found was when he pulled out the nail, there was a hole there, and that was a scar. And that's what our anger does to people. Yeah. It leaves scars on their heart, it leaves scars in there. They don't think very highly of you. Uh, once you get angry with a person, it's very difficult for them to think much different of you after that. But you leave scars on people, and, and so that's not good. So, But I thought that was an excellent story. Uh, you can probably find it somewhere on Facebook. But so anyway, um, now back to this. <clears throat> uh, he, God, He is invisible in heaven, but is in the sense is rendered visible via the good deeds that shine forth from us. You are his, we are His ambassadors of reconciliation. Second Corinthians five eighteen through twenty. You want to read that? Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely. The God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, 
as he committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And think about that, that what we are for God, we are his ambassadors. We are to let our light shine everywhere we go and with everyone we talk to. Are you representing God well? Am I representing God well? By our attitudes and our actions. From and this, thoughts. Yes, and thoughts. And, and we'll get to that uh, later. It's, that's, uh, that's a tough one. Anyway, from this verse and Matthew 5.16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And Matthew 5.20, it follows that the six segments in Matthew 5.21 through 48 serve at least a twofold purpose. Number one is to teach what righteousness looks like that surpasses the scribes and Pharisees. And number two, to describe the righteousness when lived out in the power of the Spirit. Gives a proper opinion of our Heavenly Father. Keep this commandment in mind as you med meditate on each segment. And those are the last six segments that we read at the beginning of the program. Ask yourself in each case, do my attitudes and actions in this area of my life give others I meet the proper opinion of my Heavenly Father who is in heaven? We are called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect in Matthew 5.48, that the world might see His glory in and through us. And we're going to just kind of skip to Matthew 5.48 right now, and I'll let you read that. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus climaxes this section with, incredible, with the incredible statement, to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. The references for this are Leviticus 19.2. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And Deuteronomy 18.13. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. And think about that. We have to be blameless before Him. And 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. Now, this is a heavy calling, as it were, but best of all, it is a holy calling which He has enabled citizens under the new covenant to carry out by virtue of their new hearts upon which the law is written, and the indwelling Spirit who causes us to walk according to His statutes. It is interesting that Jesus begins with an emphasis on the sanctity of every human life and the call on kingdom citizens to do all they can to honor that sanctity. So what is the problem with what the scribes and Pharisees had taught? The problem is that they were not good inductive Bible students, and because of inadequate observation and reliance on the commentaries, what the rabbis had taught as tradition, they arrived at an inaccurate interpretation of the law, and consequently, <clears throat> and most importantly, they prescribed inappropriate application based on their willful inept analysis of the Old Testament scriptures. Their misapplication of the law led to a liberal attitude toward murder adultery, divor divorce, vows, retaliation, and love. Therefore, Jesus calls His listeners and we the readers of His sermon to exhibit allegiance to a higher standard, a standard of righteousness that far surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, and which shines a beacon of supernatural light that points the lost to the great and mighty supernatural Father of lights, our Heavenly Father. Citizens of the kingdom of heaven are called to measure themselves, not by others, but by their Father who art in heaven. The sons are to be perfect, as their heavenly Father is perfect. And as Jesus proceeds to explain, that perfection is absolute perfection, and includes our words, as in Matthew 5, 33 and 35. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. In our responses to injuries, as in Matthew 5, 38 through 39, and this is another thing that 
they talked this uh, minister talked about last night was offenses that he he doesn't you don't want to take on offenses you don't want to be offended by someone because that really destroys your witness also well and you want to retaliate yeah, yeah and you want to retaliate and you you don't want to retaliate against anyone so anyway matthew 35 38 and 39 you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but i say to you do not resist an evil person but whoever slaps you on the right cheek turn the other to him also and what about with our dealings uh, with our enemies, as in Matthew 5, 43 through 45? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So at the time of Jesus, the Jews were following the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. In Matthew 23, Jesus speaks seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees, those whose righteousness must be exceeded to enter heaven. One of those woes summarizes what the religious leaders were doing and teaching the people to do. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. And again, that was uh, Matthew, Matthew 20, 20, 23, 23. 23. So we're going to actually kind of stop right there uh, for this week and we will continue on next week. But we do want to really give everyone an opportunity. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time. Um, you know, I, we just can't stress enough how much it has changed our life. Uh, I mean, I didn't have to do anything. Once I got saved and I, and I went back to work, everybody's like, uh, you know. And, and I and also remember the time that I started a new job and, and I didn't really know anybody. I found out there were some other people there that I, I knew, but I didn't really know them personally. They weren't mm -hmm. friends per se. But I went in there and, and everybody, you know, people say, well, we heard you were a preacher. And like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've, I've been known to, to preach a little bit, but, you know, okay. And, and people knew before I even got there where I stood. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I'm not worried about whether people swear or cuss. You know, they always apologize to me. But, you know, that's, that's your business if you want to do that. It doesn't bother me in the least. It's, you're the one that has to stand before God with what you do. And, and that's the big thing. You know, people say, well, you know, uh, about being a Christian. And it's like, well, you know, if, if I'm wrong, then I've led a good life and I'm out nothing. If you're wrong then you're going to stand before God and you're going to have condemned yourself to hell. But God has given us uh, a choice, yes. uh, life or death, and He would that we would choose life with Him and, and have eternal life in glory with Him. And, but it changes your life. You have, there's so much more that God has for you. He loves you. He's not condemning you, but He does love you. And yes. uh, we always read that... Um, that sin came into the world by one man, and that was Adam who disobeyed God. And uh, so, and then uh, Jesus Christ came, and he demonstrated his own love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And then if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. With the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Amen. It is so very important. And, and yes, we do, you know, we can, we can go along and say, well, boy, I sure feel sorry for that person when, when they die. But, you know, the fact of the matter is we need to mourn for that person yes. and, and pray for them to be saved before they do die. Um, there's just been so many times where somebody said, I don't want to accept God right now, maybe later. And the next day they die and they, have, they don't have the chance. So we will see you next week. In the meantime, have a blessed week and God bless everyone. Amen.